Hello and welcome to a City Voices interview with Peter Murphy. Hi, Peter. Welcome. Hello. Hello, hello. Hello. Uh, Peter, would you please, uh, in the next 15 minutes, share your story uh, from the beginning to the present? Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, I was born in the early 80s. Um, I grew up in um, Belmont, Massachusetts, which is a inner suburb of Boston. Um, I would say... Um, my early childhood was pretty normal, um, you know, relatively normal. Like my parents were trying to create that sort of environment for me. Um, so, I, but what ended up happening was that, well, I was playing sports and I was doing things that kids would do at that age, you know, little league and stuff like that. Um, and, uh, you know, I was pretty, um, I was a pretty normal kid at that age. Um, when I got a little older, when I was about eight, my father was diagnosed with um, colon cancer. And uh, that was kind of a big shock that was not part of the plan. Um, and uh, over the next year and a half or so, he deteriorated and then he, he passed away. Um, and, uh, you know, when you deal with that sort of thing at a young age, I wouldn't say, like, there's a possibility... I might have had, I mean, I'm sure we all have our struggles regardless of what happens to us. So uh, it's quite possible I might have had issues as a young adult regardless, but I think it was definitely exacerbated by, um, you know, dealing with my dad's illness at a young age. Um, so um, after he passed, um, my life did, was still, you know, I was still, I, I was in therapy. Um, I was still, you know, I got really into music as a, when I started to get to be about 11, 12 years old. I started playing music. I kind of stopped playing sports because that was something my father always wanted me to do, but it wasn't necessarily something that I was really drawn to myself. Um, but, um, yeah, I just, um, I would say as I was, you know, 13, 14, my life was pretty normal. As I got to be about 15 or 16, I, I don't know what it was, but I just started to, my mental health started to deteriorate a little bit. I Maybe I was smoking weed. I don't know what it was. Maybe that had something to do with it. Um, but um, I also started meeting people from other areas, people that, came from the city as opposed to the suburbs had a different perspective and um you know the community i was in at the time was kind of insular and if you didn't you know if you were too, if you strayed too far from the norm they didn't like that um it wasn't accepted it wasn't accepted they weren't necessarily tolerant in that way but um in any case i was having a little bit of a conflict with my home environment and dealing with the fact that I was kind of slipping towards a uh, mental health crisis. And um, basically, I um, around when I was around 18, I took a couple trips down to New York City, spent a few weeks down here, which was interesting, um, you know, getting out in the world. And then, um, and then around 2001, I took this big trip all across the country to California. I was traveling with, um, you know, uh, people that travel a lot, you know, uh, going to festivals and um, gatherings and that sort of thing, and meeting all sorts of people from um, all over the country. Uh, but what happened was I was sort of running away from some issues I had back at home, but I wanted to see the world. So I, I um, put those issues on hold and I went out and I, I did, I got to see a lot of the world. I spent about six months on the road, um, but I came back and uh, basically right around then 9-11 happened. And uh, shortly thereafter, I just really, I just really slipped. I, I really had like a psychotic episode uh, and that continued for a few months. Finally, I was, uh, saw a psychiatrist that was diagnosed at the time they had said, they thought I had schizophrenia, but later on, they 
thought maybe I don't, maybe I had a psychosis because I'm not really that disorganized. Um, but um, basically I spent like a year or a year and a half, like as like a recluse, like living in my mother's basement, like hardly going out, um, just uh, really, uh, you know, uh, really not in a good state, paranoid, um, very disorganized at that point in time and um isolated um because i kind of lost touch with a lot of people that i had known previously before then people that might not have really been good for me at that age at that point in my life people that maybe i would have you know wanted to um create some distance from at that point but just because of the circumstances you know it, it happened regardless um and then you know so i kind of um i would say i kind of bottomed out and then um and then i had nowhere to go but up and I, I i didn't feel like my life was over i started taking some you know antipsychotic medications and um my mother was actually very helpful to me at the time um and uh, she was very supportive i'm very lucky to have had such a good mother um but um you know i started taking classes at a community college um i moved into a group home in cambridge massachusetts which was pretty exceptional. It was an independent group home. There were, you know, people from Harvard, people from, you know, uh, people that performed in the Boston Symphony Orchestra. The um, president of the student body at UMass Boston was one of the counselors there. You know, it's not like a state-run place. It was independent and very, um, very progressive. Um, and I spent about a year and a half there uh, until I felt well enough to live on my own. Then I ended up living in my own apartments for the next six or seven years in and around um, Cambridge and Boston. Um, I really, you know, I didn't feel like when I had that crisis, like it was the end of my life. I just felt like I had a long road ahead of me, you know, to recover and that um, I wanted to make amends for, you know, you know, for, for being so off kilter at a certain point and for uh, being, um, you know, uh, just I wanted people to know that I was more than my illness, you know. So um, I started playing in a band. I started actually, my mother worked at Boston University. So I got into their night school. Um, and over four years, I earned a Bachelor of Science in Psychology because, you know, psychology interests me. I was interested in my own struggles, and the struggles of others, the way the human mind works and how we learn um, and how we adapt. And so I played in a band. Um, I was working. I was in school. Um, and I would say over the next few years, my life really did almost one year at a time. You know, I was making progress. Um, and, uh, you know, I still had a lot of anxiety um, that was not really being treated. Um, you know, the psychosis was being managed, but the other anxiety was not really being treated that well. Uh, it took me years to figure that out. But um, uh, around 2000, in 2008, I graduated from college about four years later than some of my peers because I did get kind of a late start. Um, and then that same year, 2008, I met my uh, ex-wife. Well, obviously, at the time, she was... Uh, I met her actually in Astoria, and then she was coming to Boston um, to go to graduate school to get a master's in fine art. And um, I had wanted to move to New York at the time because I really felt like my mentality, my the way I think, the way I function, the way the type of lifestyle I want to live, I would have been better suited for New York, this environment as opposed to where I'd been at the time. But because my um, my ex-wife was um, in school i stayed with her and because she was her english was her second language i actually had to help her a lot with like her papers and stuff like that so i actually feel like i almost have like a honorary degree in master in fine arts just from all the help i i, I provided to her um but um basically it was like we she was in school for three years and then we moved out to Marlboro, Massachusetts, it's a little outside of the city, where she worked at an auction house for about a year um, after she graduated. 
And then um, in 2013, we finally, after, you know, a lot of anticipation, we moved down here. Um, and, uh, you know, the thing with me and my, my ex-wife was that we, we had, you know, we had um, a strong relationship in many ways, but, you know, the way we, um, the way we approach work, the way we um, uh, approach life was different. You know, she, um, you know, now I'm a, I work in like a social work field. Um, so she wouldn't have wanted that. She would have wanted me to do something that would have paid more, you know, something that would have been more like, um, lucrative. Um, but you know, this is what I want to do. And I, I did acting. We split up in 2015 and then I did some acting for about three years. I took a number of classes, really got into that, really found that that was helpful to my mental health too. Um, and, uh, and then after that, I felt like I wanted to kind of get back to, maybe something a little more regular, like a full-time job. So I um, I went back and I became a peer, which was very natural given that I'd previously, I, met, I didn't mention it, but I'd worked as a teacher and a case manager in a program for out of school youth uh, from 2009 to 2011. So then in 2018, I trained to be a peer. 2019, I started working as a peer, uh, which I loved. I loved, you know, being able to help people and relate to people. And then, uh, I was doing that until this year, 2022, and now I'm working as a case manager, uh, also in a residential setting with a lot of people who are in supportive housing. So it's similar to being a peer, but, you know, I don't get to disclose or tell my story as often as I used to. So um, that's, um, I mean, I could say more, but that's kind of my background in a nutshell. Thank you for sharing all that. Uh, let me ask you, what's the uh, biggest, what's the difference between the um, people and culture in Boston and the people and culture of New York City? Well, I mean, Boston is definitely, um, you know, it has more of a, a town feel in some ways. It's not as, you know, Boston is, um, there's a lot of communities around the city that are all kind of um, enclaves of different, you know, different groups of people, you know, they say like different tribes kind of, um, and everybody interacts, but you know, there's, um, you know, it's, uh, it's, um, um, there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of higher education in the city. So there's a lot of like, uh, you want to have like intellectual conversations and really, you know, meet people that will, um, sometimes be patient with you and, give you a little more time um, than sometimes New Yorkers do, but sometimes it can feel a little bit um, uh, suffocating too, a little limited because there's such a focus on knowledge as opposed to experience. And I find that since I've lived, lived in New York, the experience of experiencing things in life is given like a higher value here. Whereas like you'll find a lot of people in Boston have quite a bit of knowledge but they sometimes don't have the lived experience of, you know, walking in someone else's shoes or really understanding another culture, you know, from like the inside out, you know, as opposed to, um, as opposed to just like sort of like conceptually. And so, so I found, yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, are you, do you want to finish that thought? No, no, I'm all about done. That's okay. All right. Um, so was there any, do you feel any shame, any lingering shame for your experiences and your behavior when you were uh, not doing well? Well, you know, I mean, right from the start, as soon as I mean, like, you know, when I was like 18, 19 years old, when I kind of like bottomed out after several years of sliding, I mean, I knew I had nowhere else to go. And, you know, a lot of my friends had gone on to college and, you know, um, and I just knew I, I had to, you know, it was just, you know, it's never too late to get yourself in a, in a better position. And, um, you know, I feel like some of those experiences, um, because they were so intense and they were so dramatic, like it's, you know, they may not never be forgotten altogether, but I think especially, you know, in the years that have passed, I mean, there, anybody that knows me now and follows my life now knows that you know I'm 
you know, in a very different place than I was back then. Um, and if people don't follow my life now and they don't know me, who knows what they think? But, um, you know, I don't really feel any lingering shame or anything. No, because I've done what I've been able, I've done what I need to do. I continue to do what I need to do to, you know, live my best life and try to live well by other people. And, um, you know, try to be, uh, give back um, as I'm able to. So, no, I don't really feel like, um, you know, I wish things had gone a little differently back then, but it is what it is. And, you know, um, I, I'm a different person now. So, um, you said acting helped you with your mental health. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah. Um, well, acting is, um, you know, you're putting yourself in someone else's shoes, a character's shoes. You're trying to understand that person. Um, but it's also about being very present in the moment, you know, um, being uh, very, you don't want to be, again, you don't want to be too, too relaxed because that can be an issue. You don't want to be too, too nervous. You want to be somewhere in the middle. So it's almost like kind of, they don't call it like being like meditative, really, but it, it has a lot of similarities where you have to kind of get yourself into a zone where you're, um, you know, uh, focused and open to possibilities and relaxed, but not too relaxed. And then you practice doing that on like you know a daily basis and it just becomes part of your life to kind of um to have that balance and um yeah i mean i've, I've heard other people say it too it definitely can it definitely can help your mental health and um you know i've heard actors are supposedly uh there's this idea that actors are the people that have um theoretically are the, some of the most healthy people you know mentally that's not always the case but um just to be able to you know put down your day-to-day -day issues your problems whatever you're going through in your life and just you know put that aside and be really present and um you know be open to the possibilities of whatever role you're playing so as we conclude this interview i ask you that um peter that you search your heart and come up with something that you haven't said yet, but that you want to convey to the viewers. Um, okay. I haven't done a lot of interviews like this. Um, I would say, um, I think, you know, It's important to be open to change. It's important to be, um, you know, for me, it's always been important to be adaptable, to sometimes go towards things that are sometimes a little scary, but can be a learning experience um, that can expand your horizons. Um, you know, every time I've been too comfortable, um, it hasn't led to me really developing myself or advancing myself. Um, um, but, you know, definitely things can always, um, things are always going to change. And sometimes that's for the better. And sometimes, um, you know, it's a learning experience. Um, but, um, you know, I think that it's important to find your support network. It's important to um it's important to have hope to find hope um and you get what you give you know really so um try to put out good energy in the world try to um you know i try to treat people the way i want to be treated as often as i'm able and um yeah, really, you get what you give. Like, that's what you'll be remembered for is basically how much you cared, how much you gave back, how much you, you know, uh, you won't be remembered as much for, you know, you you really want that to be the, you know, to put that first, like how much you love, how much you care, 
how much you um, give back. And, um, you know, that's the most important thing in life.